Hello everyone. A couple weeks ago, I took a trip to California for a week to visit my hometown, uh, see my parents and friends, uh, and check out the few remaining businesses that are selling vintage electronics. Uh, and if you're interested in seeing the details of that trip, uh, there's a very long travelogue available on my Patreon, uh, which I go to a bunch of Goodwills. Oh, <laughs> uh, one of these, this is a Microsoft floppy disk photo viewer. Uh, I visit a couple of literal warehouses full of old electronics. Oh man, this is so wild. I mean, we're just, we're here and there's nobody else here. They gave us this flashlight, but we haven't really seen anybody since. There's just noises in the distance. And I just found some pro camcorders. <laughs> um, I see some fellow collectors. So that's the monitor and it just has a gargantuan slot in the bottom. So we drop that guy. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just oh Ooh. <laughs> oh that it. is horrible uh it's a blast and i'd say it's well worth the price of admission if you have three and a half hours to spare uh but if you don't uh, or if you've already watched it um this is a follow-up uh to that all the things you see here uh, and a couple that are just out of shot are what i brought back from that trip um they range from mildly interesting Okay, they range from boring uh, to fascinating. Uh, and, you know, a few of them don't work, uh, or I didn't really get a chance to check them out until I got back here and then found out they're not things I really want, um, or I just brought them back to show off, whatever. I figured, rather than wait for this stuff to show up in proper videos, let's just go over it all, I'll show you what I got, and we'll do some show and tell. Now, I'm not gonna do this in any particular order, it's all kind of potluck, uh, so I'll just start with uh, the second coolest thing I got on the trip, which is this guy here. So this here is a Canon uh, XL-H1 camcorder, uh, which was very generously donated uh, by a viewer, uh, Robert, uh, who I thanked in person, but I'd like to thank again for his generosity because I didn't really get a chance to say it in person. Uh, there was this hornet that was chasing me around and I, I had to, to flee into my van. Uh, but uh, as soon as I received this thing, like I laid hands on it and it was immediately one of my favorite things anyone's ever given me. I've wanted one for a very long time, but only because I thought it looked cool. Um, it turns out that it's very cool in every way. Uh, it feels really good in the hands, um, and it also shoots HD video, uh, despite being from 2005, which makes it, I think, the earliest HD camera I own, so that's rad. Uh, now, anyone who was taking film classes in the 2000s will undoubtedly recognize this, uh, as the younger brother of the Canon XL1, a legendary prosumer camera from 1998 uh, that showed up in every high school film class. Uh, it was featured on the TV series iCarly. And ostensibly was used to shoot more pornography than any other single camera in history. Um, whether that's true or not, it's a fine pedigree to be sure. And I think the XLH1 was meant to follow in those footsteps. And if we wanna go really deep, uh, this guy is a derivative of the XL1, which in turn is pretty clearly a descendant of the Canon L1, uh, which is the funky kind of DSLR looking video camera that I reviewed like three or four years ago uh, when I was just a guy in a t-shirt in a basement with no script. Can't really believe I got anything done back then, uh, and that video wasn't so great, so hopefully someday I'll find a working one and I can do it again. Uh, anyway, um, it's fascinating, the elements of that bizarre little thing made it all the way into the HD era. Uh, like uh, this grip here, it's pretty much identical uh, to the one from the L1. So, a fascinating lineage, and I'm extremely pleased uh, to own something with this kind of history, uh, especially being that it shoots HD video, uh, so it's moderately useful nowadays. Of course, there's some caveats to that. If you want to get into early uh, HD camcorders, you should know that HD in the early 2000s pretty much never meant 1920 by 1080 progressive scan 60 FPS. All of those were optional and the frame rate was complicated. Uh, so the XLH1 can shoot in several different frame rates and resolutions, and uh, it has the unique, among every camera I've ever seen, uh, feature of letting you select them with physical switches. These actually pick the resolution, uh, which is either HD widescreen, standard definition widescreen, or four by three, and then this guy here selects your frame rate. Now, the best one it can do in progressive mode is 30 FPS, or it can do a fake 24 FPS, but if you want 60 FPS, you gotta switch it to I. And what does I mean? Interlaced. 
because in the early 2000s, if you wanted 60 FPS, you were getting interlaced. Um, it was actually true for all of the early HD cameras that I've ever seen, uh, and it had been true for uh, all the consumer cameras that came before. Uh, the DV era cameras at standard definition were also limited to either 30 progressive or 60 interlaced. It also records not at 1920 by 1080, but at 1440 by 1080. And if you do the math, you'll find that that's a four by three aspect ratio, uh, despite this camera shooting 16 by nine. And yes, that means that the horizontal resolution looks like crap uh, because it's taking a widescreen image and just stuffing it into a four by three frame buffer. And then when you play it back, it stretches it back out. So all the horizontal pixels are stretched a little bit. And that sounds terrible, and it is, but it was also very common at the time. Uh, it's again, true for all the HD cameras I have from this era. And it was actually true for the standard definition cameras that came before. Fortunately, honestly, it doesn't really matter all that much. Um, at a glance, you'd almost think that this was modern HD. I don't have a strong technical explanation for why this was done, but I think it was just to save on bandwidth, uh, which was a real constraint at the time. Maybe the best pro gear didn't have that limitation, but this isn't that. It's definitely prosumer. I mean, look at the shoulder pad, okay? This is how you rest the thing on your shoulder. And let me tell you, it doesn't do a very good job. Uh, I don't think that you could have bought one of these at Best Buy uh, exactly, but it was at the low end of the pro market for sure. Take for comparison, uh, my Sony PDW F335. Uh, this is a couple years newer, uh, it's from about 2007, but it's clearly intended for a bit more serious a professional. Uh, it records on Sony's weird uh, professional disc format, uh, but again, only at 1440 by 1080, so I suspect it wasn't that high end. But this still cost about $15,000, or at least it did when B&H listed it in 2010. Um, you'll also notice it's got the much better shoulder pad. Uh, now the XLH1, on the other hand, only cost around $9,000, so about half as much. And uh, since I suspect the F335 was fairly low end as Pro Gear went, I'm gonna guess the Canon was pretty consumery. In fact, uh, this one was never owned by a pro of any stripe. Uh, Robert informed me that a family member bought it just because they wanted a nice camcorder and hardly ever used it, just shot a little bit of wildlife footage on it. So I'm doubly lucky here. Not only did I get a really cool camera, but it was only used to go to church on Sundays. Uh, $9,000 is more than nothing, of course. The guy must have had a little bit of money. And there were much cheaper options at the time. So this camera occupies uh, this weird place where it's cheaper than any serious pro gear, but it's still kind of pricey for what it was. Uh, and I'm guessing that's probably why I haven't seen that many in the wild. Now, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I only wanted this because it was weird and it is pretty weird. I mean, just look at the shape of the thing. It's got uh, this part that goes up at the back here. I don't know why that is. Um, it's got so many controls, more than any of my other pro camcorders. Uh, and some of them are on this weird little stock that sticks out here. Like what, what is this little pod about? And on top of that, it has interchangeable lenses. Uh, so this guy comes off and then it's got this very strange hand grip hanging out here, uh, like the L1 that I mentioned earlier. So this is just a really weird way uh, to design a camcorder. And that's most of the reason I wanted it, but it turned out to be a pleasant surprise because it's actually good. Um, it feels amazing in the hands, other than the, the shoulder mount that I mentioned. Um, it looks amazing. I mean, look at it. Uh, it's built like a tank. This, I think, is all magnesium or something. It feels like metal. Um, and, you know, despite having way too many controls, it is more manual controls than any other video camera I've ever touched. Um, I mean, for instance, <laughs> this is the strangest thing that I've ever seen on a camcorder. It has a manual EV compensation dial, which um, apparently the XL1 had as well. I, I don't know why this isn't on more camcorders. This is awesome. It also sports uh, the largest viewfinder that I'm aware of for this era and price point. Um, it was pretty common for camcorders to have little tiny baby viewfinders. Like this one looks fairly uh, similar. This is a camera from the same era uh, and the, the eyepiece here looks about as big, but in reality, the screen that's inside there is like this big. And if you wanna see anything, you've gotta use the flip out screen on the side because um, it's just painful looking through this viewfinder. The XLH1 on the other hand, it doesn't have a flip out screen. Uh, but let's turn it on here and I'll show you why that is. 
it might be hard to see, but the, uh, so the viewfinder's on right now. You can see the picture through there. If you put your eye up to this, it just looks fantastic. It's like you're looking at a, at a TV screen. And the reason for that is if we flip up the eyepiece here, it has a gigantic LCD. Uh, it's like 1.8. Oh, now that I look at it, maybe that's like two inches diagonal. It is about the size of the flip out screen that you'd find on a conventional camcorder. It's just gigantic. Now, as I understand it, um, modern cinema cameras, uh, like really high-end pro stuff and like aftermarket $1,500 viewfinder add-ons uh, use screens this big or bigger. But as far as I know, it was unheard of at this time, certainly in something that cost only $9,000. Now, the trade-off is that it doesn't have a flip-out screen. So if you are using this on a tripod um, and like standing behind it, this is all you're gonna be looking at. And that's not fantastic, but frankly, if you're doing that, you're just gonna put a preview monitor on top of it and plug it into the video output anyway. So Canon made one screen do double duty, and I think that was a brilliant decision. The uh, footage isn't half bad either. Um, here's a little sample clip that I shot at my sister's house. Uh, this thing has a nice uh, 20X zoom lens with image stabilization, so I was able to get this great handheld shot of one of her perfect cats coming over to murder me. And here's a little more footage of a bird that I saw next to a highway. Uh, I just jumped out of my car and, and took some test footage because I was impatient to try this thing out. Uh, honestly, like I said, you could hardly tell that this is only 1440 by 1080. It looks fantastic, uh, and I don't really have any complaints about it uh, other than the fact that it doesn't have any digital output. Um, the only options it has for video out other than Firewire uh, are the uh, composite jacks on the side, and then it has a adapter back here where you can plug in a component output. Uh, they made a version that had a digital SDI out, but I don't have it. It should be right here, and I don't know if I can install that aftermarket. So that's a bit of a bummer, but honestly, there are worse things. But anyway, um, as much as I love it, that's enough about the XLH1, uh, because I'm gonna do a whole shootout video with my collection of early HD cameras eventually. Uh, this one, this one, and about mm, three or four more. Uh, and I'll talk a lot more about it and all of those then, but suffice to say, I absolutely love this thing. I was concerned that it was gonna be the coolest thing I'd get on the trip, and I got it on day one, so I thought, man, I'm gonna be driving around this whole time picking stuff up and none of it is going to excite me as much as this. But fortunately, I was wrong, so let's move on and see what else I got. All right, right from the uh, very cool to the extremely boring. Uh, this is a Chinon ES3000. Uh, it's apparently a pretty early digital camera and I like collecting those. So uh, when I found it in a box of cheap point and shoots at a really messy surplus store, I just picked it up on the spot, didn't look it up or anything. And sadly, when I got it back here, I looked it up and found out that it's completely useless to me. Uh, the thing I thought was cool about it is that it records pictures on PCM CIA, uh, which I've always thought was a pretty cool storage format. So I was excited to use it and see how crummy the pictures were, but it turns out that it takes one in a proprietary format, which I'm never going to find. So uh, unless somebody has one of those specific cards to send me, uh, this thing is just gonna have to go to the eWay store. Uh, and it's a bummer because uh, it's actually kind of a neat design. I always liked these uh, binocular style early digital cameras. Uh, and you turn it on by popping that guy out, which I think is cute. Um, but it's just not really worth my time to wait around and hope I can find the right card. Ah, I was hoping it was gonna launch it. Let's try it again. Good enough. So here's another weird video thing. This is a Sony uh, SBV66S. Now this looks at first like a uh, conventional uh, entertainment center AV switcher. You just got a whole bunch of inputs and you know you, you press a button on the front to switch one to an output. Um, and you could use it for that, but it's actually for home video editing. Uh, it takes four inputs, and if you press the monitor switches over here, uh, you can select between them like any normal switch, but the other set of buttons labeled copy uh, operate an independent switcher, and that is unusual. The idea here is that uh, you hook up a VCR to the editing output, uh, and then you put a TV behind that so you can see what the VCR is recording. Then you connect another TV to the monitor output. And at that point, you can see two signals at once, the one that you're currently recording to the VCR and one that you're thinking of recording to the VCR uh, when you're ready to make an edit. 
Now, what's wild about this is that those are the basic functions of a broadcast video switcher. 95% um, of a switch operator's job is picking a signal they're interested in, then switching it to the program output at the right moment. And, you know, Sony sells million dollar vision mixers that do that and a lot more, but that is the basic thing they do. And this unpowered mechanical switch box can do it. Um, you could almost run like a three camera TV news program out of this thing if you didn't need graphical overlays. It has no use to me. I'm dropping it off at the junk store tomorrow, uh, but it was so cute. I just had to show it to y'all first. Next up, uh, I got a couple of top mount monitors uh, for some of my pro cameras. Uh, so you know camcorders usually have like an eyepiece so you can put them on your shoulder, uh, but it's not very useful if you're using them on a tripod. So if you watch like behind the scenes footage of TV shows, uh, you'll see the operators looking at big monitors with hoods sit on top of their cameras. And these are those. Uh, now, <sighs> This one on the left, this one is exciting to me because it seems to be the exact monitor that goes with the DXC M7, which was a popular uh, late 80s studio camera of which I have about four. Uh, and it's my favorite studio camera that I have. So I was excited to get a monitor to go with it. So the way this works is uh, we take the viewfinder off. So we do that and then we move that guy because uh, that's just dead weight. And then we take this, and there's a separate shoe at the back here, just for this purpose. You slide it on there, uh, run this big nut down, and then this guy plugs into the viewfinder output. If I do it the right direction, uh, it might actually work. Let's go ahead and power this thing up so you can see it go. So as was typical for the era, uh, this is only black and white, which isn't really a problem. Um, as it's been explained to me, uh, black and white's actually better. Uh, color can be a detriment um, for viewfinding. Uh, but you can see it's got a nice clear picture um, and it just shows you what the camera's seeing and that's it. Now, cool thing about this is that the mount is uh, double articulated. So uh, I can adjust it by pulling on uh, this guy here. Let's me adjust this joint. And then if I pull on this bale, it lets me set this other joint so you can put it at whatever angle and height that you want. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, uh, it's Nito Dorito, nothing all that spicy. It's just a nice accessory, kind of completes the look. And I hope that I'll come across more of these eventually uh, so I can have a full uh, M7 studio setup with like three or four cameras. Here's hoping. Uh, I also got a newer one. Uh, this guy here, it's also a Sony. Uh, but it's got a connector that's appropriate to a lot of my newer cameras. Uh, in fact, the uh, uh, F335 that I had out earlier, the HD camera, will actually work with this because the viewfinder is still standard definition. Um, so I just need to find the mounting hardware and then we'll have a monitor for that. It's all been video stuff so far, so let's do a computer thing to mix it up. Uh, well, sort of computer. This is a Brother uh, PN4400, that's a power note. Uh, and it's probably dead. Uh, I tried firing it up. It didn't do anything other than make a terrifying beep noise and flicker the screen. Uh, I'll probably have to chuck it. I don't think it's fixable. Um, and that's a shame uh, because it is an interesting gadget. Um, I think it's really funny that someone put an Apple sticker on there because it does look exactly like a PowerBook. Um, but this isn't really a laptop per se. Um, if I open it up, you'll see that it's got a uh, very short, kind of Fisher Price looking LCD. Now, at first you might think this actually is a toy. Uh, it's not, it is actually an overgrown PDA, uh, sorta kinda. Uh, this was made by Brother, and I think that it's meant to be the uh, like portable LCD version of their word processors, uh, which used to use these extremely wide aspect ratio CRTs. Um, so I think that's why the screen is like this. So if this worked, uh, I believe it would have like a mini office suite on it, you know, with a word processor, a spreadsheet, uh, that sort of thing. But unfortunately it doesn't seem to do much. Oh well, such is life. So we've got the 5140 monitor here because I have uh, another computer, although it's one that would be a lot more exciting to someone else, I think. Um, this is an Exidy Sorcerer uh, from 1978. It's a fairly early home microcomputer. And uh, while it bears a strong resemblance to a lot of other like late 70s, 80s home computers, Apple II, VIC-20, etc., 
Uh, Wikipedia claims that it was based on the S100 computer standard that was popular uh, in the more serious home microcomputers of the era, which I think is unique. I don't think there were any other compact S100 type machines. Um, Unfortunately, that doesn't do as much for me as I wish it did. I'm gonna go ahead and fire this thing up, um, but there isn't a whole lot I can really show you on it, unfortunately. So uh, right now it's got, you know, standard basic, just like any other home microcomputer, and I can do very basic, basic stuff with it, you know, and uh, probably doesn't have a sin function now that I think about it. Run. Oh, hey, that actually worked. It has a sign function. I didn't actually think that was gonna work. So yeah, it has basic. Uh, I'm sure it has some special functions in there, probably graphics routines and whatnot, but look, I didn't buy this to write basic programs, all right? Uh, what I wanted to do was to run CPM on it, which is the operating system that was commonly used on other S100 machines, and it never showed up on a home computer like this. So. That excited me, but it turns out you need to have a lot of extra parts. Um, an external expansion chassis, a floppy drive controller card, a floppy drive, specially formatted disks, all of which is just way too much for me. So I'm probably gonna end up uh, just finding a better home for this thing, but it is cool um, to see a device that I only ever read about on like a deep dives into the Wikipedia list of home computers. Also, it has one very funny cost cutting measure. If we take a look at the basic cartridge here, you'll see that it's actually at an angle. Um, like it's kind of, it's not straight and that's on purpose. Um, if we pull it out there, you can see it's going into a, an angled cavity and I actually opened the machine up just to make absolutely certain that that's as it should be. Uh, and it is, it's got like a sort of diagonal chute that goes down to the board. No idea why they did that. Very weird. In fact, while I was in there, I took a look at the rest of the circuitry and boy, howdy, this thing looks like it was built by cavemen. I mean, 1978 was a pretty primitive year, but uh, I mean, look at all this stuff in here. It's got like arcane power circuitry over here in the, the power supply section. The whole thing just looks alien compared to even like an Apple II, uh, which looks far more modern inside. So this thing is definitely a relic of the dismal 1970s, uh, and perhaps most telling uh, is the ROM cartridge, uh, which is, I kid you not, an eight track. And I don't mean the size and shape, I mean it's literally an eight track. Um, this thing back here uh, is a slot for a, a mechanism, I believe, and that there, and uh, there's actually like little spots here where the tape would come out of it. Um, it has been confirmed that this is in fact an eight track cartridge that they just put a printed circuit board in. I mean, I'm guessing they just happened to have a line on a cheap source of eight track shells and realized that they, they fit their needs. Um, but it's still the most egregious cost cutting measure I've ever seen in my life. Um, and more importantly, it's very funny. Also in computer news, I got a Mac SE. It's a Mac SE, that's that's what it is. Uh, actually, uh, there's one other thing to say about it. the hard drives in here doesn't work, um, but it's working a little bit better than the completely hosed mini scribe that came with it. Uh, I'm going to put an incredibly loud and irritating clip in here of what that sounds like when you power it on starting now. So that's fun. Something I got that turned out to be completely inconsequential is this TV Super Scan 2. Now, uh, if you're going through e-waste, um, whether it's at an actual e-cycle center or at like a Goodwill that just has a good selection, uh, something that you'll come across constantly is a VGA to composite scan converter. Um, they're basically like Wii Fit balance boards. Your brain just trains itself to filter them out. And I thought this was more than that, but it isn't. 
a VGA scan converter is just a thing uh, that lets you take a PC with a VGA output and plug it into a TV uh, from the time before any computer had a composite video output. The reason I thought this was exciting is that some stuff on the box made me think that this had like Telestrator functionality, you know, like uh, the ability to pause video and draw lines on the screen, that sort of thing, like football commentators. Uh, it turns out, no, not really. What they're actually talking about is the uh, Remote Mouse Plus, which turns out to be a infrared remote control with arrow keys on it. We can all imagine how pleasant that was to use. I'm guessing you press the button and the mouse cursor goes and you can't make it go any faster. Um, the Telestrator functionality is just a program it comes with that lets you draw on the screen. Um, so nothing all that fancy. And as we've learned in the modern era of WebEx, you can lead corporate executives to useful presentation tools, but you can't make them do anything more than wave the mouse cursor around. Moving right along. Here's another weird computer thing. Uh, this is a Polaroid palette, uh, which is a category of device almost nobody has ever heard of uh, unless they're about 15 years older than I am. Uh, see, back in the mid 80s, uh, when computer graphics were still becoming a thing, but PC video projectors weren't common yet, uh, if you made a chart or a diagram on your PC and you wanted to display it at a meeting, you had to turn it into a slide, as in, a physical piece of translucent film. This is a presentation uh, from probably the 70s or 80s, and it consists of slides, physical slides. And each one contains uh, stuff like a chart, like a table of data. There's a, a sort of a, like a spreadsheet looking thing there that's got a, a bunch of numbers. And um, the original solution for creating these was that you actually made them with physical you know, paper, uh, and then you photographed them with a camera, developed the film, and had slides made. Uh, but if you were making those graphics on your computer, then you had to somehow get it out of the computer and into a camera. And that was tough, because all you really had for output was a computer monitor. Uh, now, you could photograph a monitor, but it was awkward, um, required kind of special equipment. Uh, and more importantly, the resolution wouldn't have been very good. Uh, once you blew it up uh, to, you know, 20 feet, it wouldn't have looked fantastic. And so they made slide printers like this one, uh, which doesn't do a lot right now, but I'm going to plug it in anyway. Where's the power switch? There's a power switch on this thing. Ooh, wow. Horrible 15 kilohertz whine. I'm going to have to notch that out. Wow, that is really painful. Take this bracket off. And inside, you'll see that there is a tube in there. It's maybe three inches across, and it's kind of freaking out right now because uh, I'm not giving it a proper signal. I don't know if it's supposed to be doing that. Um, it could be that it's broken because uh, it actually does have video inputs on the back that look like they should take composite, but when I plug a signal in, it just puts gibberish on the screen. So maybe this is broken, um, and I'm going to turn it off because, ooh, that wine is killing me. You take this module here, uh, which goes on the front, and then this is a mount ring for a camera. And there's actually a lens in there, so you take like a Minolta or something, stick it on the front, and lock that into place. So the idea is that uh, you have your computer send a slide to this thing. You would put a camera on here, you'd lock the shutter open, and then the computer would send the data a few pixels at a time, and it would build up a slide over time. Then once it finished, you'd uh, advance to the next frame, uh, open the shutter again, and then have the computer send the next slide. And then I said a bunch of stuff that wasn't correct, uh, because I'd read about other more expensive slide printers, and I thought this worked just like they did. Uh, the high-end models had frame buffers, and they printed at absurdly high resolutions, like 2,000 to 8,000 lines. Uh, this one doesn't. Uh, the tube is basically just a conventional television display, and you're supposed to connect it to the composite output of a PC CGA card. So the quality was, of course, terrible. Um, Polaroid followed up a couple years later with the Palette Plus, which accepted EGA video, and that looked 
worked a lot better, but they still don't work uh, anything like the other ones on the market. Also, uh, while some slide printers took a normal camera, like a, a Minolta that you might already own, uh, and you had to advance the film and open the shutter manually for each frame, this one uses a proprietary fully automated camera. And since I don't have that, and I think the CRT is malfunctioning, this is probably never going to actually work. Still, I'm sure I'll come across another slide printer eventually, and the rest of my explanation was accurate for those. Now this sounds straightforward enough, but uh, the tube in here, you may have noticed, is monochrome, because uh, a color CRT at only three inches would be laughably low resolution. So to make a color image, uh, this actually has to display each color channel one at a time, and there is a carousel inside with colored filters that switch into place. So it has to display each slide three times. So this is a very funky kind of device. Um, I learned about the existence of these things by accident while flipping through a 1986 computer magazine, and I've been fascinated with them ever since. They're just so cool to me. Um, but since they're deeply, intensely boring to most people, um, I don't think there's a whole lot of them still in the world. Uh, these would have sat around in an office until they eventually got thrown away. Uh, and I've never met anyone who has actually gotten one working, but I'm hoping that I can get the software for this, um, fix whatever's wrong with the tube, uh, and then when I do a video about these things, I'll be able to actually make a presentation on film, get it developed, and put it in a slide projector. So let's all look forward to that. Going back to video stuff for a bit, uh, I've got three little gadgets here of no particular use to most people, maybe not even me, but I do like how friend-shaped they are. Uh, two of these deal with SMPTE timecode. Um, now, I'm not an expert on that, uh, but in short, Within the film and television industries, every frame of any moving picture has an associated time code, which identifies that frame unambiguously uh, in terms of like minutes, hours, seconds, and frames. Uh, and I think it's uh, either within a clip or within an entire production, uh, I'm not 100% sure. Um, it is basically the universal language of film production, and I believe it also gets used in audio, although I, I could be wrong about that. Um, and there are various ways of embedding it into a moving picture, either a video or a film strip, uh, and several ways to transmit it between devices. Now, sometimes it happens that you need to see the time code for a piece of media, but none of the equipment that you're working with will display it, um, at least not legibly and in a place where you can comfortably view it. So um, there's a whole market for devices that intercept that signal and print it on an easy to read display, like this MIDI man time window. Uh, as the name suggests, the original version used MIDI time code, uh, but this one uses what's called linear time code or LTC, uh, which is a way of sending time code data as an audio signal. Um, LTC lets you do funky stuff, like put your time code on one soundtrack of a videotape, um, or if you're shooting separates, uh, where you're, you're shooting video, but your sound is being captured on a separate audio recorder, um, I imagine you might record LTC uh, onto an extra track of the audio deck uh, for later synchronization. So uh, this is just a way of viewing that data uh, once you've gotten it back off the tape or whatever. Um, but it's a neat thing to work with because it uses what's basically a modem signal. Um, the inputs here on the back are a quarter inch and they take uh, an audio signal. And uh, I've got an example LTC waveform here, which might be really loud. Uh, so I'll, I'll try and tone it down in post. All right, here we go. Here's what LTC sounds like. Yeah, it's horrible. Kind of sounds like a modem. Uh, but let's hook it up to this device. So we plug this into the audio input and then into the headphone output on my Tascam. And this is just a WAV file that I download from a website that generates these. Hit play. And there we go. That's time code. So that's it. That's um, all this one does. It's just a handy little gadget if you need something that does that. The next device here, uh, the Horita WG50, uh, does basically the same thing, uh, but in a completely different way. Uh, it also takes a uh, linear time code, but it doesn't have a display or anything. Uh, instead, uh, you pass a video signal through it and it superimposes the time code on the picture, uh, or uh, as people say, it burns it in to the picture. Uh, now to demonstrate that, we'll need a monitor, so I'm gonna introduce another thing I got on my trip. This here uh, is actually one of my favorite acquisitions ever. Uh, it is a Panasonic AG500, which I've wanted for probably a decade. Uh, and a number of people watching this are probably drooling now because this is kind of a holy grail and I got very lucky. Nobody uh, seems to have one of these things at all. Uh, and when you do see them, they're 
always damaged. Um, they're either missing the cover uh, over the controls here. Uh, the VCR doesn't work. Um, they've got like broken plastic. This has none of those problems. Uh, it works perfectly. It's basically pristine other than <laughs> the markings from the school that owned it uh, originally. Uh, and while these usually sell for at least $400 on eBay, broken, um, I got this one for like a hundred bucks. Um, so I think I might be a thief. I mean, it's not the pinnacle of anything, um, if we're honest. It doesn't do SVHS. Um, it's a low resolution shadow mask display, uh, mono speakers, it can't record. There's no remote, no tuner, etc. But in terms of style, it's absolutely magnificent. I mean, there were so few devices ever made with a vertical VHS deck at all. I've seen maybe three. So that's cool on its own. But I also love that this one is almost exactly the height of the tape slot. It's like they designed a chassis that could just barely contain a VCR and then just chose a tube that would fit in it. I love that. This is gorgeous. And of course, it's portable, um, though I probably shouldn't trust that handle. And of course, it's rectangular, which sends me, and it's off-white instead of black, which sends me, and it has the pale green and blue uh, play and stop buttons, which sends me, and I just love every single aesthetic quality of this device. I can't overstate it. If that wasn't enough, uh, in addition to being a combo TV VCR, uh, it's also a monitor. If we spin it around, uh, we've got video in and out on the back. Uh, it's only mono, but uh, I think this only supports mono VHS audio anyway, so no loss there. Uh, and anytime this isn't playing a tape, it's automatically taking composite input. Uh, there's also a switch back here for auto repeat, and I'm not sure what that says about where they expected this to be used. Um, from what I can tell, uh, it basically just, uh, when it gets to the end of the tape, it'll rewind, go all the way to the beginning and play it again. So if you've got like an in-store demo tape or something, uh, then uh, this will just play it over and over. But the other setting here, uh, which I think is called video end, uh, I believe what that does is if you have a presentation that's only, you know, five or 10 minutes or whatever, can't fill an entire tape, uh, then this will stop rewind when it detects a video dropout. Neat feature, utterly useless to anyone now, because I think uh, if you left a VCR just uh, playing a tape forever and ever nowadays, wearing it out, well, you'd be a monster. So since we have a display now, uh, and I've got a camcorder just out of shot here, uh, we can set up our timecode burner. Now, I do want to comment, this device has one of the most cursed design decisions in history, uh, which was fortunately almost entirely constrained to the 1980s. It uses a 3.5 millimeter phone plug as the power input. So there's just nine volts DC on those two pins. I hope you don't uh, bridge it against anything. Uh, also, if you have one of these, hope you don't lose the AC adapter because it'll be fun replacing it. Anyway, let's get our TV hooked up here and my obnoxiously long video cable here because it's the only one I had that would reach. So there's our camera feed and then there's our timecode display. So let's give it a signal. Plug that in there and hit play. And there we go, timecode. And we can adjust this a little bit. You know, it's, it's nothing fancy, but we can make the text uh, large or small. And you can put it at either the top, the bottom, or for some reason, in the middle. I don't know why you'd want to do that, but you can. Anyway, uh, we can also switch the data input from timecode to UB. And that always shows as all zeros because uh, those are user bits. And from what I understand, those are basically custom fields in a timecode signal uh, where you can put whatever information you want, um, a camera angle, a scene identifier, whatever. As I understand it, the most common use case for this uh, would be, uh, suppose you're working on like a film editing system um, and you wanna run off a dub uh, to a cheaper, smaller format like VHS or Video 8, uh, which either doesn't support timecode or you know you won't be able to play it in something that can display it. Uh, suppose you're processing dailies from a film shoot and you dub out a VHS copy to bring it to the director. They're gonna watch it on something like this uh, with no timecode display, but since it's part of the image, uh, they can watch it on anything and just hit pause and say, okay, at this time interval, this many minutes, seconds, and frames, we want to cut and keep the scene after that. And that way you don't need every copy of your footage to be recorded and played back on serious professional formats and equipment. Uh, and if you dig up raw footage from any production of any age, even current ones, you'll usually see timecode burned in like this. 
Um, so I don't know if I necessarily have a use for this kind of thing, but I really love useful little gadgets like this. It does so much in the smallest possible package, uh, so this one's gonna stay with me. The next device here is from the same company. It's also a Harita, uh, but this is the SCT-50 Serial Titler, uh, which also superimposes text on video, but it doesn't work with time code. So let's get rid of this. This is a general purpose titler, and uh, titlers are devices uh, for superimposing titles or on-screen text on video. Uh, and they come in a bunch of varieties. They used to be super popular. Um, in the 80s and 90s, you'd use them for adding like Merry Christmas to your home videos. Uh, and the more advanced ones could be used to make full presentations and subtitle videos, stuff like that. Uh, in fact, uh, cheap consumer video titlers were how early anime bootlegs were fan subbed, uh, although the people doing it would have killed for something this convenient. Uh, let's hook it up, I'll show you what I mean. Well, sort of. So this too takes uh, video in and video out, and it uses the same horrible 3.5 millimeter power supply as the other one. Seriously, someone should go to jail for that decision. Whoa! In fact, I just shorted it out, plugging it in. I, I just got a spark off the jack, plugging it in, because it's not insulated. Ugh. Whose idea was this? There we go, is it working? Okay, good, I didn't kill the power supply. So this doesn't seem to do <laughs> much that's impressive uh, when you first turn it on. Uh, right now it's just kind of drawing some gibberish on there. Uh, in fact, the first time I turned it on, uh, it just displayed gibberish across the entire screen. And that's not uncommon with titlers. They usually have like a little coin cell in there running the uh, NVRAM. Uh, the battery dies, so the memory just turns to random values. Uh, this one doesn't have that problem because uh, I went into the setup and I changed some settings and saved them and they saved. So I guess the NVRAM is just fine. So I don't know why it did that. I don't know where any of this junk is coming from. The interface for this thing does not look amazing. Um, besides the menu here, we can just set some very basic features. Uh, you can change the text from white to black. You can turn the background on and off. There's not a whole lot to it as, as far as like uh, fonts, colors, styles, etc. It's very, um, uh, industrial, and, and that's on purpose because this is actually an industrial titler. One of the serving suggestions on the official website uh, is to use these for labeling security camera feeds. Um, so for that sort of thing, uh, just getting the text on the screen at all is good enough, right? The interface uh, for setting the title doesn't seem great, and it isn't. Uh, these switches let you step through character cells, and then you can dial in text one letter at a time. Um, it's absolutely mind-numbing, and that's because that's not actually how you're supposed to use it. See, uh, as the name suggests, the Horita Serial Titler can accept data over serial. You're supposed to hook this up to a PC over RS-232, and then you can send it arbitrary text and commands, uh, either from the software they included or any custom software you want to write yourself. And that makes this extremely powerful. The manual suggests these could be used to operate complex video information displays, add instructional information or subtitling, log and document experiments, etc. In other words, any imaginable application. And so uh, going back to my earlier quip uh, about uh, fan subbers, uh, Horita themselves thought that subtitling was a good use for the device. And I can imagine people going nuts over this because all you need to do is write your translated script with timestamps and then write a basic program that reads through that script and just sends it over the serial port at the correct time intervals. Then you just hit start on the program and play on your VCR simultaneously and sit back and let it go through and subtitle the whole thing. I don't think anybody doing that in the 80s or 90s had anything nearly that convenient. I'd love to demo it for you, but that would require me to set up a whole PC, write some software, etc. I have a whole collection of titlers, like eight or nine of them, and I'm gonna do a shootout between them one of these days, and this will show up there. Don't worry. Let's move on to another titler. This is a much more normal video titler. Uh, it's called the Video Title Maker 2000. Uh, it's a fairly well-known device. And you know, it looks kind of cheap and toy-like, but it's actually fairly impressive. Um, you see it at first and you know, it's got like the horrible little rubber chiclet keyboard. And if you're familiar with titlers, this looks like it's gonna be just as cheap and miserable as any other from a distance, but it's actually pretty cool. The user interface on it is not half bad because it's got, uh, fonts um, and uh, text outlines and uh, borders and backgrounds and whatnot that are all accessible directly from dedicated function buttons. And I thought it was gonna be really irritating to use having seen how it works in YouTube videos before, but it turns out it's actually 
fairly slick. Um, I'll go ahead and hook it up and show you a little bit of what it can do. This has a ton of sophisticated functionality and I don't have the time to show it all to you right now. It'll show up in my, my title or video someday. One cool thing is it apparently has extensive internal non-volatile RAM because it came with a bunch of programs on here that the previous owner had created. Uh, and that's a cool thing about this. It actually supports multiple presentations, if you will. If I hit page index here, this is a list of individual screens within a program. And then uh, there's multiple programs on here. There were three that came on it. Um, I made a fourth uh, down here to mess around with. I don't know what the limit is, um, probably at least 10. Uh, for each one of these, it's sort of like uh, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, so if I select this here, okay, this is the first page of this thing. I can go through and edit it. You can see um, it's got different fonts. Um, you can put outlines around text. The fonts are not half bad. Think of them as a little corny nowadays, but they look very good. They look nice and high resolution. Uh, anyway, if we go up and then hit play, the first page of this presentation scrolls onto the screen over the input video, but then it switches to a solid color backdrop. So you can make these quite long. Uh, you can give them uh, fancy backgrounds and you can just keep chaining them together to make like I said, like sort of a PowerPoint presentation. You can't do like shapes or anything like that. If you go back and watch like 80s and 90s like workplace training videos, uh, you will definitely recognize when they're using something like this. You know, it'll cut from like somebody crashing a forklift to like a solid blue background with text scrolling over it. Those were created on something just like this. You know, there's actually a demo button on here, which I've never pressed. Let's see what that does. Ah, there we go. Yeah, see these red bars here? Uh, that's an effect that you can use. Yeah, there we go. There's that workplace training stuff. This looks great. I love this. I've always wanted one of these. I'm thrilled to have one. Let's move on. More video stuff. Uh, I picked up three video tape recorders, uh, which aren't super interesting for the most part, and two of them are way too big to bring in here. Uh, one is a Umatic VO5600, which is interesting only because it's very large and it's useful for reading the kind of tapes that TV stations threw away in the 70s and 80s, uh, where a lot of interesting stuff lives. Uh, sort of thing you, you scrape up on eBay, you know, box of miscellaneous tapes turns out to have like some behind the scenes shot of Dan Rather cussing, that kind of thing. Um, so that's cool, but otherwise it's just a VCR. Uh, the other is a Panasonic DVC Pro Deck, same deal. Uh, it's an even less interesting VCR. Uh, and the only reason I got it is actually because while I was down there, I found a box of miscellaneous uh, production tapes, several of which are labeled Tech TV Call for Help. And uh, Tech TV got acquired by G4 quite some time back. And uh, apparently, as we've recently learned, uh, G4 proceeded to throw away all of their archives. So everything that everyone made is gone forever. Uh, so these are probably some, some dubs they ran off at some point in production, and if I can recover them, well, that's better than nothing. So those ones aren't too exciting, uh, but I also got a Sony DSR-45, uh, which is now the smallest VTR I own. It's just a little guy. I love him. This whole thing uh, is just so tiny, and uh, that's because you're supposed to put two of these side by side in a 19 inch rack, uh, which is a pretty uh, wild option for a VTR. Uh, but as a result, uh, despite having as many controls as any of my other DD cam decks, uh, they're all just really tiny. Just these little baby switches that you poke <laughs> with the tip of your finger. Um, it's got these like dollhouse sized recording level knobs. It's adorable. I love it. Now this is a DV cam deck, uh, which means it'll play uh, consumer DV and professional DV cam tapes. So let's see that. Now you'll notice I don't have a monitor hooked up, uh, and that's because one of my favorite things about DV cam decks, uh, they tend to have these little tiny preview displays on here. So if we hit play, we can watch the tape right here on the front. I wish that every VCR ever made had done this. You have to squint to make out what's actually in the picture, but it's so nice to not have to plug in an external display to find out if the thing is working at all. Also, I like to imagine what it looks like to see a whole rack of these playing different tapes. That must have been cool, especially with the bright red LED timecode display. Uh, you know, they could have gone with an LCD, except they really couldn't have because even a backlit LCD is not very readable, um, especially in like a dark studio environment. So this was really necessary, but it's also very stylish and I love it. 
Now, uh, despite being tiny, it doesn't really skimp anywhere. Uh, in addition to having all the controls on the front, it also has all the ports on the back. They could have just put a few jacks on the back, like composite out for monitoring and a single set of inputs or something, but instead it's got everything. Um, composite, S-Video, component in and out. Um, and then of course it's got uh, four channel audio in and out. Uh, and then you've got your uh, timecode interface and of course Firewire. And you know, I'm not sure if that's linear timecode or some other format. And since I now have a display, let's hook it up and find out. Oh, look at that. Yeah, apparently it's linear time code. Man, I'd always wondered what those TC jacks were for. So that's a lovely little find, especially since I have a bunch of DV tapes I wanna rip. And this takes up so little space, I can park it just about anywhere. Another uh, video treasure I picked up is this guy here. I think that's right side up, uh, which is an RCA ah, CPR 300 camcorder. And uh, if you can imagine this, I actually didn't have a basic VHS camcorder before now. I mean, um, I had some VHS-C models, uh, I had some pro VHS models, but I didn't have the uh, iconic shoulder mount dad camcorder, and now I do. Now this isn't in perfect condition. Um, it's pretty clean, but it still has a few problems. Uh, for instance, if I put a tape in here, it just kind of does that. So. Strongly suspect uh, that one of the belts is snapped and needs to be re replaced, and that's kind of a pain, but the camera portion of it works perfectly. Oh, there we go. Works better if you take the lens cap off. So yeah, you've got your power zoom, uh, your adjustable iris, um, your color temperature. Uh, it's got high-speed shutter and a bunch of things like that. That all works perfectly. Now on its own, uh, that might not have made this worth it, but it came with this guy here. This here is another titler uh, of a sort that was uh, popular in the 80s. Uh, it's a little miniature one that's meant to be used specifically with this camera. Uh, they usually attach the device in some way and this one does with this little bracket here. So we just screw this in on top uh, and then this guy just slides in right here. It's very fiddly. There we go. Now we have to actually get the video uh, through the titler somehow, and for some reason, uh, you actually pass it through the viewfinder. So you unplug the viewfinder here, and you plug the titler in to that socket, and then the viewfinder swings up and plugs in here, so you still have a picture. And I don't know why this was done, because uh, I'm certain the like primary video signal from the CCD doesn't pass through the viewfinder on its way uh, to the VCR, because in that case, if you unplug the viewfinder, it wouldn't work. So this seems like a bizarre decision, but there were a number of cameras that did this. Anyway, if we turn the titler on now, doesn't do much, uh, but if I hit start, all right, there's our title, and <laughs> there's the next title. Uh, like I was saying earlier, uh, the NVRAM in this thing uh, probably has not fared so well since like 1988 when it was made. Uh, so when you power it up, it's just got a bunch of junk in there, uh, which is delightful and I don't wanna fix it. Um, I need to hook this thing up and capture like an hour of this gibberish uh, before I uh, replace the battery. Now there aren't a whole lot of options in here. Like I think you can change the size of the font uh, somewhere in here. I don't know. It's something I'm gonna mess with later when I do the titler video. Uh, so you'll see this again. But in general, uh, the idea is that uh, you've got this little keyboard here. Uh, and of course, it's for non-technical people, so it's not laid out in QWERTY or anything. It's just alphabetical. Uh, and you use these arrows uh, to work your way around the screen and then just enter text wherever you want. Uh, you can set a couple different sizes and it's got these very cheesy curtain and window transitions that um, do not look cinematic at all. Uh, and that's pretty much the size of it. Now I have two more cameras, which I'm going to briefly address, and then we'll see uh, the big thing that I saved for last. The uh, first one is this uh, Hitachi uh, HVC-10A. Uh, it's kind of an odd beast, uh, to me at least. Uh, it is a standard definition CCD camera, uh, so basically just kind of an imaging cube, uh, but the lens is what appears to be uh, like a broadcast lens. This is like a B4 mount, something like that. Uh, but broadcast lenses usually have a grip on the side that's got like zoom controls uh, and you're supposed to like focus them by hand. 
This one, however, uh, just has servos for everything. So uh, there's just motors in here uh, that run the uh, zoom, focus, and iris back and forth. And the reason for that uh, is apparently that this is meant to be fully remote controlled. Uh, so it's got a cable hanging out of that module uh, that's labeled remote. Hitachi says it's for some kind of like uh, remote learning or presentation application. And I'm not sure if we'll be able to do very much with it, especially because the uh, power input is this funky like three pin connector that I would probably have to rip out and replace. So that's just kind of a curiosity. The other one is, well, ugh, a bit more imposing, although it's not actually all that interesting once you get past its appearance. So this is a Panasonic uh, SVHS camera, or more accurately, a camera system. Uh, like a lot of other pro cameras, this is actually made up of multiple modules that connect together to form a complete unit. Uh, so the actual camera portion is just this guy up here. This is a WV300CLE, a standard definition triple CCD imager from, I don't know, probably the very late 80s. I can't find much info on it. Uh, the lens is a typical Canon broadcast lens like you'd see on most cameras. The recorder on the back is an AG7450 SVHS deck, and all these parts can be mixed and matched. So uh, you could put a different lens on here, of course, uh, or you could use this recorder on a different camera or this camera with a different recorder. Um, all you have to do is loosen a couple screws and press a button, and there we go. This guy comes off. And conceivably, we could replace this with, uh, I don't know, Betacam uh, or Hi8 or something like that. Or if it breaks, uh, we could just remove it and replace it that fast. Now, the thing is, even for a pro camera, uh, uh, this thing is absolutely monstrous. And it weighs like 20 pounds. Uh, and part of the reason for that is that it's old. But another part of the reason is that these parts aren't actually compatible. Uh, let me explain. See, the AG7450, as far as I can tell, is from an earlier generation. Uh, and when I picked this thing up, I forgot that I actually had a similar camera that already had one on it. Uh, this one here is a WVF70, which is docked to the exact same recorder. Uh, and I think it's a previous generation imager. I'm not really sure. I can't find any information about it. Uh, but they use incompatible interfaces. I thought this came apart with just the two bolts. There we go. So these two 7450s have the exact same interface connector on them, uh, but the two camera bodies have completely different interface connectors on the back of them. Uh, so Panasonic produced this thing here, uh, which is an interposer that goes in between the two that has uh, one connector on one side and the other connector on the other. Uh, and it doesn't weigh all that much, but it is enormous. So it adds a whole inch to the length of the thing uh, and just generally makes it a lot chunkier. Uh, so the cameras themselves are a little bit different in size, but not that different in weight. And if you were able to dock uh, the VTR directly to the back of the uh, newer one, then it would probably be about the same size. But since they had to put this thing in here, it just kind of makes it impractical. Anyway. None of this matters because it turns out that this camera doesn't even really work. When I picked this up, I was excited because I thought it was a type of thing I didn't have. Um, well, I forgot I had that one, which is pretty much the same thing. And the VCR is broken in this one in the exact same way, so I'd have to do a, a belt replacement on it. So it's not super useful as is. And on top of that, uh, if we look at the picture here, uh, there's these vertical striations on the CRT uh, that are probably well beyond my ability to fix. So mostly I'm just happy that I got to see a camera this obnoxiously and uselessly large, but I'll be much happier to get rid of it. So that was almost everything that I brought back, uh, except for one item that I've kept for last. It's the sconce. Remember the sconce? This here is a Steadicam. Uh, it's on loan to me from a friend. Now, uh, some of you know what a Steadicam is, some don't. I have known what one is, and I've really wanted one for, I, I don't know, probably 20 years. They're basically like uh, overgrown gimbals, uh, you know, like what people use to stabilize cameras, uh, sort of hold the camera in place as the operator moves around it. Uh, but this is a system that goes further. It totally isolates a camera operator's body from the movement 
of a camera. It's like a gimbal that works in even more dimensions uh, for basically perfect stabilization. They're an absolutely essential part of modern filmmaking, and now I have one, uh, at least temporarily. This case contains a Steadicam flyer, uh, which is, as I understand it, a really old one. Uh, it's pretty beat up, heavily used, uh, but it does still work. Uh, and it is more or less a piece of serious professional film gear. I'm sure people have better stuff now. Maybe this isn't all that impressive compared to what you can get for like 600 bucks nowadays. I don't know, but it's got the name and I'm sure it has history and that's good enough to get me excited. I'm gonna put all this on in a minute. I, I just can't take it out of the case yet because it's there's a lot to it. Uh, anyway, I'm not sure if I'll be able to actually use this to make videos, uh, but I'm gonna try. And honestly, just getting to handle one is like a dream come true for me. So. I'm gonna take a few minutes now and show you how one of these goes together and what it does. Now I do wanna caution uh, that I'm not an expert. Uh, I'm just somebody who watched a couple of videos. Uh, I don't really have the faintest idea what I'm doing and I might put this together incorrectly since it's literally my third time ever using it. These things are dangerous if you don't know what you're doing uh, as I'll demonstrate and you shouldn't try to use one without proper training like I am. So this here is the vest uh, and it anchors the whole rig that I'm going to be assembling to my body, uh, pads it so it spreads the weight, etc. So this goes on here. Ah, thank you. This uh, big aluminum brace here is what's gonna be doing all the work and the rest of this is just spreading the weight around. So it's gotta be strapped to you everywhere like a safety harness in a car. I don't have the faintest idea how to adjust this vest correctly. So I probably look like a total clown to people who actually know what they're doing. Okay, now this is the vest, it's more or less on, and now we need the arm. I'm not actually ready for the arm yet, but I'll show it to you. So this here is the arm, uh, and it's uh, basically a huge chunk of aluminum, and it's just very wobbly. So this is probably the most dangerous part of the whole thing. It slides into this thing here, it's called the socket block, you gotta run these bolts down. Now, these are supposed to be set very carefully to uh, balance the thing, but I don't know how to do it yet, so I'm just kind of half-assing it. And now, as you can see, I've got this big wobbly thing hanging off of me, and if I were to just let this come around and catch me in the mouth, I would absolutely take out about half my teeth. Uh, so you gotta be super careful with these. Now, this is basically uh, an Ergotron, like, like one of those monitor arms uh, with the visa mount that you might have your uh, LCD on. Uh, it's a pair of uh, parallel arms with springs inside. So if I push down on this, you can see it does one of those. And um, like I was saying, this is terrifying because I could put my hand in there and it would uh, <laughs> mangle me up pretty good. Uh, so I'm gonna take this off until I'm ready for it. Before we put the arm on, we need to get the sled ready. And this is the sled. Uh, this whole thing, not just the uh, mount at the top, like you might think. Uh, so the camera is gonna ride on here, on top, and then on the bottom we have a screen and some battery mounts, and in the middle is a conventional gimbal. So this is a three-axis bearing, and if you were to just put a camera on this alone, without the vest, you'd have pretty good isolation. You'd be able to do pans, and to boom, up and down, without your body necessarily transferring all of its motion uh, to the device. But to get uh, that extra isolation, we've got to put this on the end of the arm. And to do that, we have to balance it. So there's a special stand for that. This guy here, take the sled, uh, put that in there. And we'll get our camera. I was very pleased when I looked up the manual for this thing, it must be from about 2005 or 2006, uh, because the exact camera on the front of the manual is one I have. That worked out. So that slides on there. To balance this thing, you've gotta put the gimbal on this pin here and then do a whole bunch of really complicated adjustments uh, to get the center of gravity just perfect. I'm not gonna uh, go through it all right now. Uh, if you're curious, actually, uh, you should go watch uh, Steady Red here on YouTube. I watched his videos to figure out how to do this uh, and I thought the process was pretty fascinating. In short, uh, you're supposed to get the center of gravity just right so that when you drop it, it takes about three seconds to go vertical, and that's maybe a little fast, but I think we're good. So now we can put the rest of the thing together. So I'm gonna put this guy in the socket block. All right, now, uh, oh shit. I forgot to put this thing on the right side of the stand. Uh, it's supposed to be over here with the gimbal free. And uh, now with the arm on, 
pick this thing up, you basically lean down, get this pin in here, and then stand up into it, and I messed it up, but there we go. All right, so now, nominally, we are steadying our cam. Now, I am not an expert on this thing at all. I have done this exactly four times, but you can see basically the idea here, and if I don't know how to keep from running into the monitor yet, this guy sort of floats in space with a minimum of effort. I can boom it down, I can bring it up, I can pan, and I can tilt, and all of it is isolated, uh, at least as much as possible, from my body. So I can step around like that, or like that, and the camera stays in nominally the same place. Now, a really skilled operator could do just about any standard camera motion with one of these things, uh, and a whole bunch that uh, can't be accomplished any other way. Uh, but I'm not one of those, and my rig is 20 plus years old and not set up properly, uh, so I'm not gonna do any of them. <laughs> and I don't have any test footage of this yet uh, because I am terrified to take it outside. In fact, I'm surprised this thing hasn't exploded on me yet, uh, as I'll explain in a moment uh, once I get out of this ridiculous getup. Even though this was supposed to be a brief video, we'll find out if that was the case, uh, I probably would have spent a little longer demoing this thing if I hadn't found out that it's actually missing a critical safety component. Uh, this pin right here at the top, uh, which is what holds your entire rig to the arm, is supposed to have E-clips on both sides, and they're both missing. Apparently weight is the only thing that's been holding this in place, so uh, uh, my camera rig could have just gone tumbling off here and exploded on the floor at any time, so that's great. Since I don't want to tempt fate, uh, we'll save the serious demo with my $2,500 black magic for some other time. Anyway, not to repeat myself too much, but even if I don't get this thing all properly working, I am still kind of floored that I get to have this experience at all. Even with it being old and busted, uh, operating one of these is really a remarkable experience. Uh, it, it feels like nothing else, especially to my back muscles. Uh, I threw up my back the first time I put this on and I could barely walk for four hours. And I can feel that's gonna happen again. So if I didn't already have enough incentive to get in better shape, this thing is now my red dress. It'll fit again someday. But anyway, uh, with that contraption all put away, we're now done. That was everything I had, and I think that stuff was all pretty cool. Uh, so if you thought so too, make sure you subscribe so now you're into this sort of thing. Uh, and remember to turn on notifications if you wanna find out when I upload more things. And remember, there's a much longer video cataloging uh, how and where I got all this stuff, among other things, available on my Patreon uh, for $5 or more. So if you wanna see that, and if you wanna support me, uh, head over there and subscribe. Uh, I literally couldn't have any of this. I couldn't have gone on a trip at all uh, without the support of everyone on Patreon. Uh, I can't thank you all enough. I'm incredibly grateful. And everyone else, thanks for watching.